would be like, hey. No, you'd just be like, arse gang. Arse gang? <laughs> <laughs> there, that's the intro. I did it for you. <laughs> encyclopedia reading, go. Here's a disclaimer. There are a lot of words in this encyclopedia that I'm not natively familiar with. It is not a language I speak. If I butcher any of them beyond comprehension, this is an apology ahead of time. It was a success. <laughs> Ours gang, Year Walk. Year Walking was at its core a vision quest with the purpose to being to foresee the future. There were very rigid rules concerning the Year Walk, and not adhering to them could prove very dangerous, even fatal. How the practice of Year Walking came to be is shrouded in mystery, but it seems to have been a widespread practice in Sweden until the beginning of the 19th century, and in some rural areas, as late as the beginning of the 20th century. The practice was likely over a thousand years old and most certainly pagan. Year walking varied greatly, regionally and even locally there may, might have been differences between one village and the next. All the variations had a couple of elements in common though. A year walk could not be done on any common day. There were certain days a year when the gate was opened, generally in liaison with important festival days such as May Day, Midsummer's Eve, or Christmas Eve, and most commonly, New Year's Eve. A year walker could not partake of any of the food or drinks that were served on these days, a sacrifice of no little significance, since these feasts were some of the rare occasions when food would be plentiful and varied. A year walker had to avoid other people, so they commonly locked themselves in dark rooms and were not allowed to see a fire for the entire day. Perhaps not a vast sacrifice on Midsummer's Eve, but on cold winter days, it would be uncomfortable at least, if not hazardous. If the year walker followed these steps, he would leave his dark room at the stroke of midnight. This would be his last chance to cancel the year walk. Once he ventured out, there was no turning back. The church was the final destination for a year walker. On his way, he would typically encounter a number of supernatural creatures, which would pose a threat physically, mentally, and spiritually. If a year walker made it to the cemetery, he would walk around the church in an intricate pattern. This would open the year walker's eyes to the future, but it would also lure out the church grim. After having completed the year walk, the walker would see visions that could manifest themselves in different manners. When the year walker left the cemetery, he might, for instance, see a somber procession of dancers dressed in their finest church clothes. These would be the people that would die the following year. A reoccurring theme is, of course, the year walker who meets his own ghost on the road. Another story tells of how the year walker would see newly dug graves. Love played a great part, too, so a year walker would typically meet wedding processions or even attend weddings yet to come. One testimony from the late 19th century tells of a mental patient named Martin Nilsson, who described his visions as otherworldly experiences. Before I saw what happened next year, I lived among the stars. I lived there for many lifetimes, it seemed. What do I care for next year? Time has already ended. Today, the practice seems to be almost entirely forgotten. Do you know how long it would take us to year walk since it's like five miles to the nearest church? At least. Skog's Raid, the Holdra. The Holdra is known to have played a part in Norse mythology, but she is likely of an even older origin from when man lived off the forest rather than the fields. The Holdra was a guardian of the forest. She tended to the trees, plants, and animals. A single large tree in a grove surrounded by smaller trees was often considered to be the Holdra's home, or even the Holdra herself. In most stories, she presented herself as a beautiful young woman. This was, however, not her real appearance. Very few saw the Holdra's true face, and even fewer lived to speak of it. She was often described as a lonely and woe-filled creature. Her relationship with humans was very complex. She would enthrall a man with her beautiful song and lure him deeper and deeper into the forest, where she either wedded or killed him. The man kissed by the Holdra became apathetic and slow. According to some accounts, the Holdra was a positive force. If a hunter was kind to the Holdra, she might blow her breath down the barrel of his rifle, which would bless his hunt. Colliers considered her their friend, as she kept fires from spreading from their charcoal kiln. She also helped those who willingly offered blood to her, but this was dangerous as the Holdra might drink the giver dry. The Holdra was thus capable of doing both good and bad deeds. It was very hard to predict whether she would help or harm, since she played by rules known only to her. 
So, like, did we get married, though? <laughs> I don't think so. Or's daddy. Or's the daddy. Or, Bakahostan, the brook horse. Sweden is a country that has a lot of lakes, rivers, streams, and brooks, and Swedish folklore is filled with strange creatures residing in the dark waters. The brook horse was a pale horse who lived in creeks or lakes, luring children to ride on its back. The brook horse's spine grew for every rider that it lured on top of its back. When the brook horse was satisfied, it leaped into the water, whereupon the children drowned. The brook horse had a lot in common with the Nix, a handsome young fiddler who lured young girls down into the water, and according to some, they were one and the same. It's likely that the brook horse was made up to keep children from playing too close to the water. One of the more unusual descriptions comes from a story told in the north of Dalarna. A young man is on his way home from his work at a charcoal kiln. He decides to wash up in a nearby creek. The man finds a strange stone, formed like a, child, a small child in the water. He picks it up. The man notices that he is not alone. He is being watched by a horse walking on two legs. The horse stretches out a human hand to the man who gets frightened and runs home to a shack he shares with his fellow workers. He tells the tale to his comrades who laugh at him and call him a drunken fool. He shows them the stone that now looks quite ordinary. The man curses and goes to bed. When the workers wake up the following morning, they find the man dead in his bed, his lungs filled with water and the stone nowhere to be seen. The brook horse was almost always closely associated with death, not always in a negative way. For instance, in the sad folk tale Little Nils, the brook horse is the one who finally leads Little Nils' soul home and thus ends his long series of misfortunes. Where's daddy? Where's daddy? Mylingen. The Myling. Sounds like a movie. <laughs> <laughs> the Mylingen. -in. <laughs> Infanticide was a fairly common crime in Sweden during the 19th century and earlier. The two most common motives were that there were no room for another mouth to feed or that the child had been conceived outside of wedlock. The souls of those unfortunate children became mylings. Typically, the mylings were murdered by their mothers, often unmarried women who had been left to fend for themselves. The myling would commonly be left in the woods to die, or they would have been drowned by their mothers in brooks or bogs. Some mylings died at the hands of angel makers. The angel maker would typically be paid by the child's poor mother to find a decent home for the infant. When the mother left, the infant was murdered. The most common way for the myling to haunt was through a horrible wailing sound. The myling might take the form of a ball of light similar to that of an ear blast or a Scandinavian will-o'-the-wisp, and lead the curious traveler astray. Sometimes they would cry for their mothers to breastfeed them, which would apparently set them free. One story from Bergslagen tells of an old farmer on his way home through the forest. He is approached by a small child who follows him and says, Grandfather, Grandfather, I am so hungry. The man tries to ignore it, but the child keeps on nagging, so finally the old man loses his patience. If you can find someone to feed you, then feed, but you won't get any milk from me. The child seems pleased and leaves. When the old man comes home, he finds his daughter lying dead on the floor, bleeding from her chest. The child he met was the spirit of his murdered grandson. A person who helped the Mylings find their way to the other side was often left with a gift. According to some sources, the Myling would be taken in by other supernatural creatures, such as Hobbes, or, if it had been drowned, the Brook Horse. No, no comment that time? Bab. <laughs> what were our Babs' names? Um, you don't remember our Babs' names? They were... Pachosif. Pachosif! Rockabilly. Rockabilly. Menu. Menu. And Junior. This is the menu baby. This is the menu baby. Junior. Nope. Not Ravnen, the Night Raven. Carrion birds were deeply linked with misfortune and death in Scandinavian folklore. The Night Raven, or Not Ravnen, was certainly no exception. The Night Raven was described as a large bird with a sharp beak, sometimes with holes in its wings. If a person gazed through those holes, he would become ill. Other stories told of a giant skeleton bird that could never satisfy its hunger. Travelers foolish enough to be out at night risked being devoured by the terrible bird, especially at festival days such as Christmas or New Year's Eve. The night raven has also been described as an ordinary raven, but if it landed on a house, someone would die shortly with a terrible fever. Overall, the night raven was strongly associated with disease. When farmers sent their children out to collect wild birds' eggs, they had to be careful that they did not pick the eggs of the night raven. 
Those eggs were considered deadly. But if the child was unsure, he could knock on the egg three times and say, Out with thee, evil spirit! If the egg belonged to the night raven, it would turn black. And the night raven not only infested the eggs, it also possessed birds, preferably carrion birds. According to some sources, the night raven was a spirit of an evil, greedy man who had not been buried properly. The greed manifested itself in the night raven's fondness for shiny objects. <laughs> the goat lord! Goat lord! Kirko Grimmen, the church grim. Of all the creatures in Swedish folklore, the church grim was doubtlessly the most complex and certainly the most feared. Little is known of it, since it was considered bad luck to even speak about it. The church's the church grim's appearance varied, which could possibly be attributed to the nature of the church grim's origin. When a church was built in medieval times, an animal was sometimes buried alive under the floors, most commonly goats, since those were comparatively cheap. There have also been stories of criminals being buried alive as punishment. In other versions, the criminal's heart was cut out and placed inside an animal carcass that was sacrificed. The heart was central in many of the myths surrounding the Grimm. Stories from the south of Sweden told that if you could touch the church Grimm's heart, you could stare into the eye of creation. The church Grimm guarded the church against thieves and grave robbers, but because of it, even honest folks avoided the church at night. Some stories say that if you were unlucky enough to be the last one to die during the year, you would serve the church Grimm the following year. There are other stories that suggest that the church grim was not a guardian at all, but rather a sort of parasite that was drawn to the energy of the church. While there, it fed on people's hopes, dreams, and fears. A recent and controversial theory suggests that the church grim was closely related to a nameless Bronze Age deity. The Your Walk Encyclopedia is a collaborative effort between Smogo and Theodore Almston, who is the author of all the written content. Oh hey, that guy's real! Theodore Almstom was born in Stockholm, 1968, but spent most of his youth in Edinburgh, where his mother was born. This guy's real, and he's written three books on Scandinavian folklore, and uh, the Crone's Tongue has been translated into 16 languages and received the prestigious Hornet Award. Um, that sounds pretty awesome. He's had numerous appearances on Swedish television, and an unaired children's short film called The Grim oh. was based. I want to see it. That's I, that sounds like something I want to see. It's exactly what children want exactly what the children want and i hope this episode hasn't been exactly what you want um not likely but those are all the little encyclopedia pages that i uh skipped over during gameplay uh and decided to condense down and read um in a more clear concise way uh and anyway so um by the time i'm recording this the last episode of year walk has already aired so you know just thanks again thanks again for watching uh, and God, I love this game. Yeah, and that's, and that's your walk. That's your walk. See you later, guys.